So you kind of mentioned this towards the beginning of the, of the interview um, with the lawyer and opera. Um, but normally when kids are growing up, they get a general idea of like something that they want to do, especially like when they're very young or uh, their kindergarten teacher encourages them and they're like, yeah. oh, you can be anything you want. And the kids are always like, oh, I want to be a ballerina or oh, I want to be a veterinarian. So uh, again, like you had mentioned, you would you were looking into opera and uh, being a lawyer. Is there any reason that you wanted to be that? Or is there anything else you wanted to be before, before you had that idea? Um, well, members of my family had a significant foot in both or in both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Clemmer was the understudy. She was my cousin. She was the understudy to uh, uh, Peter Pan, Mary Martin. Mary Martin is famous for having never missed a performance of the entire time of the run of Peter Pan. Had she ever missed a performance, my cousin would have been her understudy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she was, she uh, missed her big chance because she spent five years or so of her productive life uh, as the backup quarterback to uh, <laughs> Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I, my, uh, my father was, uh, uh, basically adopted by a, uh, a district attorney of Plainview, Texas. Mm -hmm. And, um, he had an amazing career. He, uh, went on to be, um, he, he actually served in world war one. Uh, as an infantry officer, came back, finished law school, and went into being a prosecutor and then a district attorney. But he stayed converted from infantry to the JAG Corps when he became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And when World War II broke out, he was called up. And because of his experience prosecution, and he was a very bright fellow, uh, they put him in charge of, of uh, safeguarding and cataloging the evidence at Nuremberg. And he worked at Nuremberg for until all the people were found guilty. Oh. And uh, then he came back and was immediately appointed to the Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas, which is the highest criminal court in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And then he ran for the Supreme Court and he served three consecutive terms in the Supreme Court, 18 years until he retired. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the idol of our family. I mean, he was a war hero in one war in combat and the other in behind the scenes, a uh, very bright guy and um, very much a gentleman, Texas gentleman, if you'll ever, ever want to meet one. Um, and so those two things, it got me interested in those ideas. But in my readings, I had, I had wondered if I could be a fighter pilot. I had really thought about aviation uh, and aviation and intelligence. And I found a field that, that I could do both. And I, I fell into that whole thing. I, I really, I talk about that. Uh, I got pulled out of college with eight semesters still to go. Eight, eight, not semesters, eight units. One semester still to go, half time. And they, because I was not taking a full load, they pulled me on active duty. It's all I needed to graduate. And they needed me and they saw that I wasn't taking a full load. So bang, congratulations, you're in the Navy. And I went to boot camp and said, guys, I'm doing okay. I'm the editor of the school newspaper. I'm singing all over the place. I'm working half time every day. I'm still doing okay in school. I'm an Eagle Scout. I've got my silver award, my God and Country award. I've been a leader, this and that. Uh, I think I understand leadership and I think I'd be a good officer. And they said, we see what your record looks pretty good. We'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. And they gave me orders. It was to a cruiser. And I was crushed. I mean, just bang, crushed flatter than a pancake. I saw the, saw the guy the next day that told me to help me out. And I said, he said, you helped me out. And I got orders to a cruiser. What happened? Then he said, jerk, that cruiser's being built in San Francisco. It's not going to get underway for another nine months. You ought to be able to finish your degree in nine months. And I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so because I did that, uh, and I was working on that, my division officer knew that. And um, uh, when they needed a driver for the captain of the ship, Stansfield Turner, um, I became his driver. And he lived about, a, he was independently wealthy and lived in a beautiful 
sky, uh, skyscraper. He lived in the top floor penthouse of a, of a skyscraper in San Francisco. And we would drive to the shipyard every day. And, and because of traffic and everything, I often would spend an hour or more in the car with him both ways, an hour total, about a half an hour each way. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about everything. He was probably the brightest man I've ever had long-term conversations with. And I did that for over a year. And he pulled strings and got me my, my commission. And I think I paid him back. As a matter of fact, he and I had lunch uh, about 12 years after I retired. And I said, I just want to say thank you. To, you know, you gave me a hell of a career. And he said, uh, I think you paid me back, guy. <laughs> so I was truly honored. But yeah, probably fighter pilot. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, if I was going to go in the military, I wanted to be a fighter pilot originally. But in reading my books, those guys had nerves of steel and super reactions. And, and I, I always felt I was, I grew pretty quickly early in my life. I, I put on eight inches in about a year between the sixth and seventh grade. Time I started this, time I left the sixth grade and started the eighth grade, about 15 months, I, I, I put on eight inches. Went from five feet to five eight, and uh, and I was I'm pretty bulky, and I was the biggest toughest kid of my school. One of those one of the guys I felt probably tougher than me. We were friends, but um, and then everybody else grew up. <laughs> Paybacks for <are> hell. <laughs> because of that I never felt myself terribly um, coordinated, but then I wrestled for three years, and you got to be coordinated to wrestle, but it's a different kind of coordination. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> so when you were writing your actual book, what was your writing process like? Was it very fluid? Did you just let ideas come to you, or uh, were you very organized in? Uh, I'm carving out thirty minutes a day, and I'm going to write. And if I don't write, then I'm going to sit here until I do. <laughs> um, the answer is D. All the above. I went through various stages, but eventually I said, I'm going to put this. And actually, I, I drew a, um, an outline. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and, and then I guess after I've been writing for a couple of years, I realized the great way to start this whole book would be to tell my story of, of stepping off the EP3 there in, in Atsugi and, and having that flashback, because that really kind of set the stage is that I really did all of those things. Yeah. And um, uh, and it, it's, it's unique, best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. There is one man who just recently died. He was a friend of mine named Don East. That my hats off to him. He, his career was even more odd. But between the two of us, I don't. There must be somebody else out there, but I don't know him. But I went to the I went to the Air Force, and I could sit any position in their airplane for my time in school, and. Um, Sub, sub school and an experience and the air force said well the navy has obviously sent a ringer and i kept saying no i'm somewhere back in the middle of the pack skills wise i i know men that are better in every one of these positions that i am and then i got to thinking about it there's seven different positions seven different systems i got to thinking about it and said, i don't know anybody except don east that's better than me in all of them and um generally everybody is and I was a linguist, but I was also a special signals analyst. And I was an uh, ELAND analyst as well. That's the difference. Special signals communications, ELAND is radars. Um, and I just, as I said, I'm a very curious fellow. <laughs> and, and when I went across the, 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 uh, uh, the Pacific, we took the, uh, the, my uncle's gray yacht <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> From San Diego to uh, Vietnam via Japan, uh, I had a lot of time in combat. My office was right next, well, actually in a corner of combat. Uh, I was the acting intelligence officer through an odd set of circumstances. I'm a YN3, and there was three of us on the team. And one guy took a piece of shrapnel through the eye, not from combat, but from sharpening his knife, and not wearing safety glasses, and a piece of his knife broke off, a of his blade, and went through his eye. And so he's gone. And the other guy was the also the main propulsion assistant in charge of the engines of the ship, and it failed its preliminary inspection. And as I say, at that point, I'd spent a year with the captain, and the captain calls in the lieutenant and says, you will spend all of your time 
making sure we pass this inspection, you know, this non-passing grade, you're going to give your responsibility over to Guy Thomas, YN3, and he is going to be the acting intelligence officer. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> and the lieutenant said, yes, sir, I, I, I read you five by. And so for five months, I was the acting intelligence officer on that ship as a YN3. And that's what I got my evaluation. That's what gave me the, the tickets to go into the, the field that I did go into, because it's normally extremely competitive to get into the Naval Security Group. Yeah. And uh, they had a second pick behind um, behind the nuclear submarine program, which is run uh, as an iron fist. <laughs> was back in those days. I don't know what it's like today. Nuclear submarines are pretty, pretty tight. And, and you can see why they're very expensive and very complicated. Just yeah. like an aircraft carrier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what advice do you have for new writers? Go for it. Do it. Do it. Uh, probably make an outline. Um, then you can plug your anecdotes in to your and as you remember them. Uh, I uh, I actually forgot the worst day of my life, military life and most significant day of my military life until the last minute. I, I don't know why, I just didn't put it in there. Just had, had, and then one day I was talking about it and I said, you know, people need to know that. I discovered some writings that um, said that the Soviets were probably gonna try to screw up our command and control systems by taking, like they just did with the pipeline. And these writings were, were old but uh, i thought that was pretty important and i started looking at vulnerabilities and then we had some significant vulnerabilities in some of our systems that sure looked like it to me and i started asking people what kind of safeguards we had and they were minimal uh, nsa would blow right through that kind of encryption and i was pretty sure that so with the kgb and i tried to tell people about it and um, in 1984 Five, we put on a war game where I am, had actually people fool with some of our satellites, electronic mm -hmm. warfare, and it got the head of the Navy's attention. And we actually put on a, a war game at a symposium at Newport about seven months later that I was the host for. And the admiral, three admirals that ran Navy space, three different aspects of Navy space um, were there. And I go in the next, the, before the morning to make sure that the trash is out and every, the room's orderly and ready. And here's this admiral who's gotten there early and he's a, he's a hero. He's a well-known, he's the father of Navy, classified Navy space. And I introduced myself and he said, oh, I know you, you're the jerk that's caused me all this trouble. And you don't know what you're talking about, Thomas. And I said, well, I was kind of hoping for a little more warm reception than that, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I said, sir, I've just spent five years looking at this, and I have had all the tickets that I know of that exist, up to and including B. I can say that now. Back in those days, I couldn't. And I've interviewed a lot of people, and I've got a lot of experience in that area. And I think I could screw with your satellites pretty well if I wanted to. Yeah. And he goes, well, we'll see about that. And we had the next day, three, three days meeting. That was a low point of my career. and. Um, about 17, 18 months later, I again saw him at Newport at the start of a war game. There was a cocktail party called an icebreaker the night before the war game. And we were all there in our dress blues, and as it was required. And he's across the room talking to another admiral. And I, I, I come in, I see him. I do a hard right turn to go to the other end of the room. And <laughs> I don't want to see him, but a, a, a gap appears in the crowd and he sees me and he'd come over and talk to me. And I go, oh, geez, this is great. I'm going to get beat up by this admiral again from another admiral I don't even know. And I go in there and he said, I'm glad I saw you. I said, why? He said, punch you back. <laughs> no, um, I didn't say that. That's what I was thinking. I said, we, uh, I want you to know that I've decided that after that meeting back last March, uh, that we probably ought to look at this. And I had one of the big study tanks take a look at, at your it's your vulnerability analysis. And uh, they came back and you know what they said, guy? And I said, I, Admiral, I have no idea. I did not realize that it, that it happened. He said, yes, sir. They said, if anything, Guy Thomas is 
um, analysis is optimistic. We have some huge problems we need to fix. And so can I take you to dinner? And so uh, he took me to dinner at a nice little restaurant in Newport with the three of us, the other admiral who went on to be the deputy head of, of a U.S. Space Command, Jack Frost. Um, the three of us had the dinner. Line. It's the only reward I ever got for that, except my satisfaction. Uh, but I, it was a, it was very good. That's a huge part of uh, of your story, and it's it's kind of astounding how uh, when you get off track with writing, or you get so involved in it, and you don't realize you left out these huge chunks huge chunks and stuff like that so I absolutely agree that having an outline is extremely important for writers and I mean that's why they generally teach it in school now nowadays whenever you're like writing narratives and stuff so well I did that in in my my thesis I did a a thesis at USF the University of San Francisco um, Mm -hmm. as a history major Uh, basically they didn't teach you to to be a teacher they taught you to be a historian and that's a significant difference and a historian basically is, is an analyst, is, is an intelligence analyst, pouring yeah. through, not in real time, but, but ex post facto. And as I say, I'd studied German, and I also took a course in Middle English. Um, mm-hmm. And I could actually, there's only one copy of Henry VIII's papers ever made, and that's stored at the University of San Francisco. It's in the rare book collection. And I was able to read his papers mm-hmm. almost in real time. And I, my thesis was on the economic necessity of the Act of Supremacy of 1534. Huh. Do you know what the Act of Supremacy of 1534 was? I, you know, I actually do have a general idea because I'm kind of a history nerd, but I'm, I'm sure that the audience would love to know what it is. Well, it's, it's Henry VIII's Declaration of Independence from the Roman Catholic Church. He basically says, you will pay attention, you will send money to me you will not send it overseas and and what happened is he was at war with the king of spain and the king of spain had captured the pope and he was having the pope send out orders to send money to the pope who was giving it to the king of spain so he could buy arms to fight henry that's kind of the elevator speech right there yeah and and that's why he uh uh it wasn't because he wanted to marry anne boleyn Oh, that certainly was was part of it. The major part of it was that he was at war. That's another paper I wrote is war is not caused by religions. It's caused by economics. Mm-hmm. People are, they say they're fighting for religion because it sounds better, but it's really, I want to live better by, by stealing your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So does writing energize or exhaust you? Um. Uh, well, it's, it's exhausting, but also when you, you, you get it right and you're reading, you go, yeah, this, this really sells, sings to me. Uh, that's pretty exhilarating, too. Yeah, absolutely. If you could change one thing about your book, and again, if you could, um, what would you change and why? Boy, you know, I, I don't think I've ever, ever thought of that. Um, I don't know of anything I'd change. Um, maybe interesting format-wise. I might put all the pictures in the center rather than having interspersed throughout the book. Mm-hmm. It, um, I actually intentionally put, when I was talking about the MiG-17s, I put a picture of a MiG-17. When I saw MiG-21s, I put pictures of MiG-21s. When I was talking about Chicago, I had a picture of the Chicago. When I was talking about the Horn and the Warden, I had pictures of them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that you ended up editing out of your book? Yes. Yeah, there's actually, I wrote my book, and as I say, I sent it to NSA, and they, they took out a very few words here and there. But when they went to the National Security Council, they deleted a whole paragraph I had written. Well, it's task number one of our implementation task of our national space policy. I wrote that. And uh, they said, you can't put that there. It's an unclassed paragraph. It was an unclassed paragraph from the fall of 2009 until the 21st of June of 2010. And then that's the day that I learned that they had decided to classify the whole, all of the implementation directives and put them in a separate document. Um, 
uh, and mine was going to be included, but they left it intentionally unclassified. It had a U in front of it, but the, the fact that it's been taken out and it's never been implemented, even though it was task number one, and that was not an accident. The uh, chief of staff of the president of the United States, I never talked to him, but I talked to people that did talk to him, and he thought that was the most significant thing in the whole document. And I wasn't going to argue with him because I agreed with it too. That is C Sigma. It's collaboration in space for international global maritime awareness. It's how you can use satellite AIS as that baseline for information. Mm -hmm. And uh, all nations of goodwill would be, would be willing to work together. And that's what it says. Mm -hmm. And it's unclassified. So I'm, but they took that one paragraph out. That is, and, and there were some things that I took out because afterwards I said, you know, there were a couple of things that, that happened to me that I thought they may have missed the significance, but I know the significance of it. Mm -hmm. I saw something in the, fall of 1974 that to this day I'm very reluctant to talk about in any real detail. It, it was a, it is possibly a huge vulnerability of our, our nuclear weapon systems. Oh. And that's probably changed, but, but I don't know. Uh -huh. I was curious, aside from opera and aside from uh, doing research, what do you like to do when you're not writing? Um, well, these days, gardening, but before that, sailing. I love to sail. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's one of the reasons I became a Sea Scout, is that uh, uh, one of the doctors uh, in my church had a, had a lightning sailboat, about 22 feet long, and we went sailing on it, and I loved it. I thought, boy, this is really cool. And I've actually been on the helm of a, of a boat about, about 100 miles off Cape Hatteras. It got knocked down by a 40-foot wave. And that was not much fun. I thought I was dead that day too. I was on the helm and the, I told the captain we all need to cut behind this. It was a, uh, a freak storm, a road wave in the middle of a white squall. And uh, we, need to, we need to fall off and, and not go into this. He said, hold your course. I tried to get him to turn and look at what I was seeing. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, bang, down we went. And we were on our side for five or 10 minutes. Seemed like it was an hour and a half. Oh my God. I actually thought the ship was going to go ahead and capsize. Yeah, that's that's super scary. Oh my gosh, that was scary. How are you able to? Here's a here's a uh, random question I have for you. So during all of those moments, how are you able to keep your cool? Like, how are you able to? What was running through your head, and what what did you? Use I, I've to actually talked to people call? that have been in that situation before too. Time slows down. It seems to all of a sudden you can do things in sequential and you understand what your options are very, very well and, um, and how you do, how, what you need to do to, to get out of it. Yeah. I mean, I've been in midair and realized that I was going to land on my head and, and falling down the stairs and I was able to turn myself around so that I landed on my knees rather than my, than my head in the air. And I'm not an acrobat. But I knew what I needed to do. Yeah. And, and that was certainly true that day. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, I, I could tell you stories that day that, that was just not fun. I imagine. So, how, and, and that was true that when we took that missile hit mm -hmm. on, uh, on Warden, um, I'm flying through the air and I'm, I'm noting things around me as I'm flying through the air from the concussion. Yeah. And uh, other people said the same thing. I mean, I wasn't airborne probably more than four or five seconds at the most. I can't even imagine how rough that all must have been. But uh, I'll tell you the thing that really, that really got me that I'll stick with me the rest of my life, and that is the scuppers on the, on the bridge, the, the uh, things that drain. Mm -hmm. the, the blood was over the scuppers. It was over two inches high in the, in the bridge. It was, it was 10 men bleeding profusely, nine men bleeding profusely. One man was outside the bridge. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That, was a, that was amazing. Holy cow. I'm, I'm sorry. That, that, that image kind of just reminded me. Um, there was a, 
the a Hungarian queen um, that I'm trying to remember her name. It her last name is uh, Botany, and basically she was known for 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 killing the uh, young maidens that were living in her her village. And uh, there was a piece of text from the trial uh, that was you could take the blood that was on the floor of her uh, essentially her murder chamber uh, by the handfuls and saying that it was two inches, just like that, that exact same image kind of just popped back into my head. Yeah. Because that's absolutely bonkers how much yeah. blood that it was. Yep. Oh gosh. I don't think that is actually in the book, um, but, but I do talk about the fact that it was, it was very, very bloody. Mm-hmm. I imagine. Well, what three words do you feel like describe you best? Curious. And probably curious, curious, and curious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I also have a sense of humor up to a certain point. Mm-hmm. And, then, and, and then I get very, very serious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Curious, sense of humor, serious. <laughs> if you had to create a slogan for your life, what would it be? Hmm. I can't believe it happened. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. About 15 for a lot of different ways. One, all the different good things that happened to me and the bad too. But uh, the other, um, I think I thought I was, it seemed my last sunrise about 15 times in my life, in my military career. I thought there was a good possibility that I was not going to see the sunset that day. And that time probably, uh, probably I have to count that time on the on the, the Benito 42 that got knocked down off Cape Hatteras, uh, the, the, the sailing boat, sailing, sailing ship. Um, that was pretty exciting, too. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, there were a lot of times there that I thought we were going to crash or be shot down. Yeah. And um, actually, in my book, I talk about the Soviet submarine fired a torpedo that had a zero bearing drift on it, which means it was coming right at us. We could hear it in sonar. And uh, the captain, I was the acting ops officer on the, on the ship because the ops officer had gone nuts, was confined to quarters. And um, captain turned to me and said, uh, is, your, what, is this a war shot or are they just trying to get our attention? And I said, I know of no reason for this to be a war shot, but you know, I've been monitoring what's going on and, haven't seen any communications of, of anything saying that the world had turned to turnips and um, uh, the electromagnetic environment, if they were getting to do something, would either go dead silent or would be going total bananas. And we haven't seen either one of those. So I think they're just trying to get our attention, Captain. And he said, well, they've certainly succeeded in that. <laughs> and they had. It went right by us. It, it, I don't know how close it was, but it, the bearing drift was such that it sounded like it went just right like that. You could hear the Doppler as it went from up Doppler to down Doppler as it went by and it went uh-huh. right by us. You didn't have to hear it in sonar. It went, you could hear it go by the, the hull of the ship. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And had it hit us in the, we were actually faced away from it. So that it was coming at our stern. Had it hit us in the, in the in the propellers, it would have disabled us. Good possibility. Oh my gosh. But th- that was a tense moment. Mm-hmm. If you could invite three people to dinner, living, dead, fictional, or real, who would they be and why? Oh, well, R.V. Jones would be one. Um, um, Darwin. Darwin is, is, is a guy I've always been absolutely fascinated with. Um, probably not Napoleon because he's a megalomaniac. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but it would be interesting to, to see where uh, uh, what what his cut on all, everything was. Um, Catherine the Great, another fascinating person of mystery. Peter the Great, Eisenhower, maybe uh, Eisenhower. I think. Um, um, was one of the least uh, recognized uh, 
presidency. And he did a, some really amazing things, both as a general and, and as a president. <laughs> he gave us stability for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the lies that uh, were told about how he had let a missile gap grow between the Russians were, were false and everybody knew it. Everybody that needed to know it knew it, but he didn't feel that he could talk about it. So he, he was a fascinating man. <laughs> if you could read one book over and over again for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Ah, again, the two books, Wizard War by R.V. Jones and, uh, and, and Darwin, the, the, uh, the Voyage of the Beagle. Not, not the origin of the species, that's whatever. But the, 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 that's a great um, adventure story. Mm-hmm. And, and it's well told uh, about how he discovered the finches and, and uh, all the different places he went and, and uh, how stupid some of the birds were. We think of condors as being wonderful birds, but they were, mm-hmm. according to him, they, they were very, very easy to catch in those days and, and, uh, and eat, but they didn't mm-hmm. taste very good. <laughs> So anyway, I still have a lot of sticks in the fire. I, I find it amazing that I am, uh, I'm 77 and that I'm um, um, still full of wonder and, and interest in, in uh, my legs. Now, I, I now wear braces on both legs because both my knees are torn up from mm-hmm. accidents. Yeah. But um, other than that, I'm, I'm in great shape. Well. If you could eat one food for the rest of your life, what would you eat and why? Oh, well, it'd probably be steak because I grew up with, I grew up with hamburger. And <laughs> uh, as, as a native Texan, I, uh, I loved meat. And my father was a, was a very good barbecue person. Um, my, my wife is a Peruvian and she does some amazing things with chicken. She does some amazing things with fish. And she does many things with beef too, but but just a I've introduced her to just a plain old grilled steak, which is not something that was in her menu before. But mm-hmm. but you know, that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and I hate to admit it, that was one of my reactions when I went to to the Air Force. Uh, we flew up to Omaha to attend a meeting, and that night landed at five o'clock in the afternoon, got to the club about six, and um they said, we got a special on tonight in our club steak. Yeah, it's a pretty good steak. And they set it in front of me. And I was amazed. It was one of the best steaks I've ever had in my life. And I spent another six or seven months in Omaha over the next three years. And I have to admit, Omaha beef is, is well, a, that reputation of being very, very good. Come to find out, it's corn fed. Yeah. In Texas, we, we feed it on Milo maize, not corn. And that oil of the corn gives it a very rich flavor. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I'd like, I'd like uh, to probably eat steak the rest of my life, but I'd like it to be Omaha steak. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Kobe beef. Kobe beef is good too, mm-hmm. Japanese beef. I, I, like, I like the steak of, of Iowa and uh, in Nebraska. Yeah, um, well, if you could instantly learn any skill, what would it be and why? Oh, it depends on whether I had a chance to practice it or not. Um, I, I fake being Pavarotti or Mario Lanza and people tell me I do a pretty good job. I'd like to be better than them. <laughs> 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 Go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you could be any animal, what would you be and why? A deer, maybe, because they get to run. Animal, no, an eagle. I'd like to be an eagle because they soar. Um, February to April of 2012, I had walking pneumonia. I spent about six weeks in and out of bed. And there were several times there that I became either a hawk or an eagle, hallucinating. And I felt I was flying. And that was the most amazing flying. I was swooping around and gliding over meadows, gliding over seashores, looking down for something to eat. And mm-hmm. It was amazing. Well, there are now 25 hours in the day. How do you spend your extra hour? I'll be reading. I, I don't do enough reading. I have uh, 
an office full of interesting books. I've at least scanned all of them, I think. Um, I gave away several truckloads of books one time, but I was just looking for a particular book yesterday, and I put about four of books that I would like to read again. I set them out that I'm going to watch too much TV, and I need to read books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been trying to do that myself, actually. Um, I, I've i picked up a, a load of crime books and newspapers and stuff like that. And I just, I love researching that sort of thing. And I really do think that that reading is just, it's, it's, it's amazing in the sense of you could be taken completely away. And there are so many varieties of different types of books that it's just, yep. yeah. And, you're right. I understand exactly. I, I grew up before TV. Mm-hmm. I was in the third grade when I, when I saw my first TV. I was last half of my senior year of high school when I saw my first color TV. I remember it very well. It was in the house of Bud Smothers, who was a neighbor of mine. <laughs> and uh, I was jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last set of questions that I have for you are quick fire, which is don't think, just answer. So deep sea or outer space? Deep sea. Spring, summer, fall, or winter? Spring. Salty or sweet? Salty. Day or night? Night. Pancakes or waffles? Ah. (laughs) Um, Pancakes. The the, the reason I laughed at that is because my wife, I brought home 2000. Two, maybe 2001, I think it was 2002, a, a recipe for that I picked up in San Diego in the newspaper there for Peruvian corn pancakes. Mm-hmm. And she didn't like it. I loved them. She didn't like it. So she experimented for the next six months, must have made 10 or 15 different varieties of that theme. Uh, and they're now the best pancakes I've ever had by, by and away. There's not even close. Mm-hmm. so pancakes those pancakes <laughs> chocolate or vanilla vanilla coca-cola or pepsi coke hamburgers or hot dogs hamburgers fruits or vegetables fruits gold or silver um, well, of course, for investment, I, I would be gold, but silver, I, I've, always, I've always thought silver was beautiful. Ketchup or mustard? Mustard. Sandals or sneakers? Sneakers. Milky Way or Snickers? Ah, Snickers. <laughs> no doubt about that. All right. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you today. Again, thank okay. you so much for coming on and sitting down and sharing. It was all like super interesting. And I'm sure that the listeners are going to get a lot out of it. I, I do appreciate just taking the time out of your day and well, being my pleasure. It was a, open. <laughs> I'm a, I basically wrote my book for my grandchildren and uh, to, to, so they would know that uh, that their their grandfather was a was a bit of a different fellow, and and also up for history, especially the second one, the, yeah. because I was a part and parcel of, of what is modern history right now, what's going on. This revolution on what's available in space is, um, I think I called it before anybody else, not because I'm that smart, but because of, when we got the money to build the first satellite AIS system. About uh, 10 different organizations came and wanted to partner with us from all over the world, Canada, Norway, Germany, France, Italy, and Japan. Mm-hmm. And uh, they all started talking about what their plans were. And I go, holy cow, this is going to be a revolution. And, and it has been. It is. It, it is. People call it an explosion. I call it being a maritime person. I call it a tidal wave. Yeah. There's a tidal wave capability that's just now coming on the horizon. Just now beginning to break around us actually yeah so 
That's it. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much. I, I, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. My pleasure. <laughs>